Hello, Zach Murphy here. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in today to my channel. Today I'm going to continue my survey on the Gospels Bible study series, and we're going to take another look into the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And before I go any further, let me open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get into your word and to study it together here on social media. I pray, Lord, everybody watching is edified and built up in you, Lord, and put in a deep hunger in everyone watching for your word, Lord, and to seek and serve you. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, we are covering the rest of the part of Jesus' death. And in the last week, we looked at the events leading up to the death of Jesus Christ. And today, we're going to actually look at the actual death of Jesus Christ. And as we go through this teaching with these scriptures, and we're going to kind of incorporate all the Gospels to help us get a good perspective, I want to encourage you to take the time to read the whole account of the death of Jesus Christ. And going back to last week's teachings, the events leading up to that. So let's go first here to Matthew chapter 27 verses 3 to 9, and this is in the New King James Version. It says, Then Judas his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful, and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders saying I have sinned by betraying innocent blood and they said what is that to us you see to it then he drew down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hung himself Judas was the one disciple who who betrayed Jesus Christ. He was remorseful for what he did. He had a sense of the guilt, and then he hung himself. As I go further in this teaching, I want you to take this into perspective. When we come to Jesus for the first time, right before we repent, we have a high sense of guilt that we have done wrong through our sins. But only because of Jesus, we don't have to live in guilt and shame anymore. Because through him alone, and through his blood alone, our sins are washed clean. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, in the New King James, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Realize this, that our sins are forgiven when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And when we repent, when we place our faith and trust in Him, we need to remember sometimes to forgive ourselves and truly, truly receive the gift of salvation as only through Christ alone. Now let's look at the rest of some scriptures regarding the crucifixion. In Mark chapter 2 verse, not chapter 2, 15 verses 2 to 5, it reads, Then Pilate asked him, Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. One thing that we must know is Pilate did not really want to crucify Jesus Christ. He was shocked at Jesus' silence to the accusations from the chief priests. Jesus could have tried to have given Pilate a satisfactory response to the accusations and could have been pleased, but Jesus stayed silent. This shows us the obedience Jesus had to the Father because Jesus knew that he, has, he had to be crucified. It was all part of God's perfect plan from the beginning of time. And in verses 12 to 14 of the same chapter of Mark's Gospel, Pilate answered, and said to them again, What then do you want me to do to him whom you call king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said, Why, what evil has he done? But they cried out more, Crucify him. 
Pilate asked the crowd of the Jews what they wanted to be done to Jesus, and they yelled for him to be crucified. Pilate, reasoning with the Jews by asking what evil Jesus has done, and then only responded with crucify. This only shows us that Pilate did not want to truly crucify Jesus. He was simply trying to satisfy the people in the crowd. And with what they wanted to happen to Jesus. And they wanted him crucified because they, he was going against everything that the religious systems at that time were involved with. He did not meet their what they were expecting for a Messiah. And we know that through reading through the Gospels. You know, they were expecting an earthly ruler, but Jesus came from a kingdom that was far beyond that, far beyond what they could imagine. In verse 16 of the same chapter of Mark, it says, And the soldiers led him away to the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. I want you to notice the word band in this scripture is translated from the Greek equivalent of the word in Latin, cohort, which means 600 soldiers. There are 600 soldiers here. When Mark wrote this in his gospel, it was not used technically, but to show that there is a large group of of soldiers that mocked and beat Jesus Christ. Just imagine that would be some that'd be a sight to see. If we go to the verses seventeen through twenty, and they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him, Hail King of the Jews, and they were mocking him. They struck him on him on the head with a reed, and spat on him, and bowing the knee they worshipped him, and when they had mocked him, they took off they took the purple off from him, put his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. To simply put Jesus went through all this torment from these soldiers, and just imagine what your Lord and Saviour went through here at Calvary to redeem you from your sins to save humanity from the sin problem that we inherited from the garden. Now we have just seen Jesus' trial and the torment from the soldiers. Now let's look at Jesus on the cross as it's recorded in John's Gospel in chapter 19 verses 17 through 18 where it says in the New King James, and he, bearing his cross, went to a place called the Place of Skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. We find that the two other men are beside Jesus on the cross in Golgotha. And let's see that in Luke chapter 23, verse 32. It says, There were also two others, criminals, led with him to put, be put to death. So we see that these two men were criminals. Beside him being crucified, what types of crimes did these, these two commit? And we see the answer in Matthew chapter 27, verse 38, where it says, Then the robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the other, and one on the left. They were two robbers. So Jesus was among thieves. And that is something that was also prophesied in the Old Testament. He was among those who were thieves, and he was the one who knew no sin. He was the perfect spotless lamb that was slain here for all humanity. And it's a matter of one putting their faith and trust in what Jesus has already done 2,000 years ago. We see the Apostle Paul writes, and he had a, the revelation of this. For he who, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We become the righteousness of God in Christ. In Christ you are the righteousness of God. You need to realize that if you're in Christ, you are the righteousness of God. You become the righteousness of God. It's not something you're going to become, you know, someday when you go to pass from this life on to glory. It is now. We need to realize that we have the ability to have the crown of righteousness on us, and we need to live in that, live a pure and spotless life. 
We need to behold righteousness because we are in him, the one who makes us become righteous before a holy God when we don't deserve it. We don't deserve it because of our sin. But he declares us worthy. Despite all of our sin, all of our past, all of our guilt. In John 19, verses 19 to 24, we'll go on to tell us about Jesus being given the title of King of the Jews at the cross, and about the soldiers casting lots to divide his garments. And I'd like to skip to John 19, verses 26 to 27, where it says, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by him, said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then the disciple then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that point, <clears throat> and from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. This is where Jesus entrusted the Apostle John as Mary's son. And some people believe that this scripture gives Mary a level of authority like God, but we know that that is a false teaching there. And also I want to point out here where it says, where it refers to John as the one disciple who Jesus loved. You know, John actually wrote the Gospel of John, obviously, and John experienced that divine love of Jesus Christ. And, you know, that's why the Gospel of John is often called the Gospel of Love. Jesus could have designated any of his brothers to do what John the Beloved would do here. But he chose one of his disciples, and one who had a deep revelation of love clearly here. You can go on and read in John 7, 5, where it says, and I actually don't have it on the screen here, but it tells us in the New King James, for even his brothers did not believe in him. So Jesus chose someone who believed in him, who walked with him. That is so powerful. So, so powerful. And in verses 28 through 19 of John chapter 19. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. Jesus became thirsty, and they gave him sour vinegar on a sponge to sip on. This was portrayed in Psalms 22.15, where it says, My strength is dried up like a postured, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Jesus tasted death for us. We deserve death. We deserve the fullness of death, but he tasted it, and he drank willingly of the cup of the wrath of God in our place. Then in Psalm 69, verse 21, they also gave me all, excuse me, they also gave me gale for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Jesus needed this drink so he could say his final words. This also shows the amount of suffering Jesus went through to die for our sins. In John 19.30 it says, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished, and bowed up his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus told us 2,000 years ago, It is finished. It is finished. Sin has been paid for. The ultimate sacrifice was finished. The prophet Isaiah talked about this, about Jesus Christ a lot, and you will find a lot of reference notes in the Gospels that go back to Isaiah 53, verse 12, which tells us, Therefore I will divide a portion with the great, and he shall divide spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death, and he was numbered with transgressors, and bore the sin of many, and made intercession for transgressors. And then in John 19.42 it says, So they laid Jesus, because of the Jews, preparation day, to the tomb nearby. And you know this takes place on you know how we celebrate Good Friday, but there's also different views to the timelines in which Jesus was crucified. 
and one of those views to the timeline of the death, burial, and resurrection is right here, which I will share. This is not my own diagram, but this is from Beyond Today TV, which goes into depth of the High Sabbath, the Weekly Sabbath, and if you look here, it says Jesus was crucified about 9 a.m. on Wednesday of that week, which would be a total of three days and three nights in the tomb to the resurrection. So, we just looked here that Jesus paid the high price for our sins here so that one could have eternal life. And when one becomes born again, you should have a strong desire to not sin anymore and to seek God on correction as you go through your walk with God. Just because you said the sinner's prayer does not mean that you can go back into sin all you want without a care in the world. Just because you said the sinner's prayer and altar call does not give you a free pass to stay out of the Word of God. You are to live a life obedience to the Word of God. You should have a strong desire to do so. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24 to 26, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it? to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul or what will man give in exchange for his soul and I, again I encourage you to read all these accounts of the death of Jesus Christ for the study on the four gospels here and the last piece of this to cover is in Revelation 13 8 which just wraps up the the death the sacrifice of Jesus Revelation 13.8 in the Amplified Classic says, And all inhabitants of the earth will fall down in adoration and pay him homage, everyone whose name has not been recorded in the book of life of the Lamb that was slain in sacrifice from the foundation of the world. The sacrifice of Jesus was already established in the beginning, before the beginning, because the world was was created through him, the Logos, because he is the Word of God. And we need to realize that here. This is so well wrapped up here in Revelation 13, 8, that he was the Lamb slain in sacrifice from the foundation of the world. His sacrifice was already established in the spirit realm before this world was created. And Revelation here, this, you know, you're not going to read Revelation to understand how things are going to end. You're going to, have to read the book of Revelation to see the unveiling of Jesus Christ because that is what it is about. And that is all for this teaching. God bless you and have a great week. Okay, and if you would like to learn more about me and check out my other teachings as well as blog posts, you can go to my website, steadfast-ztm.com. I post on there regularly, and you can also subscribe to a newsletter. There is a page there to look at missionaries. I would encourage you to donate to as well, as well as other links to other teachers of the Word of God that I personally follow myself and I encourage you to follow as well and there's some other resources on there for Christian living and studying the Word of God. Additionally, I have a devotional available on the fruits of the Spirit. The print version is currently $7 and the ebook version is $2. I highly encourage you to check that out. It is a very um, fundamental teaching and it's very easily laid out for you to understand and apply to your life. Also, I would like to encourage you to pray for CMI Global. I'm a part of that ministry fellowship there. I'm credentialed through them, and CMI Global is a ministry fellowship that helps equip and establish and strengthen the local church. So please join me in praying for leadership as well as provision and blessing for all the other ministers and churches within CMI Global and the website uh, cmiglobal.info is available for more information or if you would like to donate to them. I'd also like to talk to you about the School of Discipleship through EndureHardship.org SOD, 
which is where you can check it out. I attended this program and I'll be a graduate of this two-year program as of May, at the end of May 2023. If you are looking for sound Christian teaching and discipleship, I highly encourage you to check this program. You can do it from anywhere. They do weekly Zoom meetings for you. If you enroll in the teachings are awesome. Um, they will help strengthen your walk with the Lord and help you build a lifestyle of discipleship, which is very important. This is for anybody, whether or not you want to be in ministry or not. I believe this is crucial for any Christian. There is just so much given in this school here. It has touched my life, and I know it has touched others, and it's uh, led by Dr. J.P. Price. You can find out more about this school here. I'd highly encourage you to check it out. It's very affordable, very reasonable. Again, I would highly encourage you to check this out, and I'm sure it will be a blessing for you as well, and share it with others. You might know somebody that wants to go through discipleship or go through some training to be better prepared for ministry. This is the place to do it at, and they definitely Dr. J.P. Price and the other instructors with this program do a very good job of pouring into all the students I know has helped me, and I trust it will also help others and be a blessing to others, and God is definitely using this program here.